talking about Harold, Andrew, Duke de Jean today. He was born on February 4th, 1909. And uh, I want you to tell us about first meeting Harold de Jean here in New Orleans. Well, let me see, it was roughly January. Yeah, it must have been January 61. And uh, I used to go to the parades. Well, I went to any kind of music that there was, you know. And I went to this parade. Bill Russell used to keep a chalkboard up in his thing and it would tell you where a parade was. And it was uptown somewhere, just a little uptown. It wasn't far uptown. But uh, anyway, I got there pretty early and uh, I saw Alvin Alcorn standing there, the trumpet player. Bill Matthews, the trombone player, and a guy on the bass on Anderson Minor. I got to know him later, but I didn't know him then. And uh, Andrew Jefferson on the snare drum. Uh, the bass drum hadn't got there yet, but he came. And they all were there talking, you know, and uh, finally Anderson Minor, the bass horn player, said, here come the man now. And walking about two blocks came this guy. <laughs> You know, with a black leather coat on and his parade cap, you know, and um, he shook hands with everybody. And uh, I don't know who it was, it was just Alvin probably say, this is this boy's from England, uh, Barry Martin. And he said, Harold Dejon, glad to meet you. And uh, he said, okay, get lined up now. Come on, put the trombones in the front. You know, this, that. All right, he said, uh, get ready when they come out to this church. We're going to play them to the corner. Then we'll, we'll open up with Lord, Lord, or something like that. He was calling all the, it wasn't his brass band, but he was calling all the, it was Anderson Miner's brass band. He had a natural, I don't know, air of knowing what he was doing, I guess. A, a sense of leadership. Yeah, a sense of leadership that came across really good. And, uh, and the people all respected him because he came from a musical family, you know. He really took over the brass band. And that's what led me the following year when I came back here in 62. And I said, uh, Harold, look, I said, you're organizing everybody's brass bands. Why don't you get a brass band of your own? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, why don't you get a organize a brass band. I said, and I'll record it. I'll make a recording of it. Well, I, I had a small record company. I'd started it um, by then. Started in 61 when I came back from New Orleans. And it was, you could only at that time press 100 records. And then you had to pay purchase tax, well, 99. So you couldn't make any money. You are lucky to break even. But I, I wasn't interested in making money. I was interested in recording music, you know. But, um, and then it, of course he, he made different recordings. Well, the recording he made, I told you, at the, the melody end with Lionel Fairboss. That's the Mighty Four. Yeah, the Mighty Four. And um, they all said the same thing. The only place we could record the melody in. So, um, Harold said, well, we go over there. So we drove over in his Mustang and, uh, I was out praying to goodness, and when we went by, there was this old peck of woods standing there. You know, and I, I figured it must be the owner. I hope Harold don't blow that goddamn horn playing Dixie, you know. Da -da 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 -da. But he didn't, thank him. Anyway, we walked up to this guy, and he could watch us. He was watching us like that from a block away. And Harold no, knew no fear whatsoever. He went and said, Look out! When I come here, this boy's got a big record company from England, he comes. He's going to put you on the map. Put a picture of, of your place. It was called the Wagon Wheel, and it wasn't called the Mel Melody Inn. They changed the name. Okay. But he said, um, yeah, he'll put a picture of you on there. That's all we want. We want you to give us some hamburgers, some fried chicken, and anything we want to drink. And we're going to put you on the map. And the guy sort of... He was dumbfounded that this was a colored guy telling him what he was going to do. <laughs> and he said, oh, thank you. 
And Harold just said, don't mention it. We'll see you Sunday, 2 o'clock will be here. You have everything ready. But that's the way Harold was, you know. And, uh, but with the brass band, there was 10, 11 pieces in it. So it was twice as much cost to put out. Um, but anyway, we, I said to Harold, well, if we do this, we can get you started with your own brass band, you know. And he said, yeah. I said, I don't know why you didn't do it anyway, because you'd be running everybody's brass band for them. And I said, what are you going to call the band? He said, I'm going to call it the Olympia Brass Band, after a band that Arnold Dupass had back in the 20s. So I said, well, that's good. He said, yeah, nobody used that Olympia Brass Band for 40 or 50 years. So I said, OK. So we decided we were going to do that. And when the record came out, it, came, it could only be a 10-inch LP. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put Howard's picture on the front with a little girl. I don't know who the little girl was. He sent me the picture. He said, he's one of my youngest fans. And we put this picture on. And I wrote the sleeve notes. And uh, Howard was, was the first record he'd ever had out under his own name. Would you believe that? He'd been playing. All of his life he'd been a musician, mm -hmm. been nothing but a musician, you know. Right. Harold was just personification of music, you know. And he was interested in, well, he and George Gaynor, the two of them, were interested in the music of our people, they called it. So they knew that there was something different about what they were doing. I mean, the... <laughs> And Harold made more of a success with the Olympia band than the Eureka Brass band. It was much more, it was internationally known, it toured. And Harold knew so many people from his work at like shipping lines. You know, he was a chauffeur. And he, he was the strangest guy because he, he'd go into a room of directors and say, how are you all doing? You know, he just, he wasn't sort of, put down by anything, nothing, nothing scared him, you know, and um, I think that he just, uh, uh, he got a lot of help from the people at like shipping lines, they pushed him into jobs with the Olympia bands, and uh, plus his own personality, I mean, he had a million dollar personality, I mean, uh, that Olympia brass band became very, very, um, <clears throat> what's the word, popular. And then he got this guy, Milton Baptiste. Uh, that was Howard's discovery. I don't know where he found Milton. But um, he told me, he said, I got this guy. He's a young King Oliver. His name is Milton Baptiste. And I was a bit skeptical, but Milton could play. And, uh, and they sort of I think Harold led the band and did its affairs, and Milton sort of was like a manager, maybe. Uh, and they pushed the Olympia. They went, they toured all over the world, different places, you know, I couldn't believe. We brought him to England. I was, I had my English band, and we were bringing New Orleans musicians. 65, we brought Harold. I don't think he'd ever been out of the United States then, you know. And he was looking forward to it. And um, we played jazz clubs, you know. I think we played a couple of brass band parades that Harold played with us. But mostly jazz clubs. And he said, uh, don't you all ever play no dances? You know. And I said, uh, hardly ever. So he said, damn, well, what is this music for? You know, New Orleans dancing. By that time, my wife at the time, Carol Martin, uh, we'd had my old, my oldest son, Emil, when I was making this film. <coughs> we had him, a little baby, you know. And uh, I don't know who it was, I think it was her, she suggested we make Howard the godfather. I got a letter, I was looking at it just the other day, and he said, um, I would love to be Little Emile's godfather, you, you sign me up.
at one time, my son Emil and I had come from New York. Because I don't know what we're doing in New York, but anyway, we flew to New Orleans. And Harold took the whole Olympia Brass Band out to meet us. He was always a fantastic godfather to Emil. He had sent him, it wasn't a birthday that he didn't get a gift, you know. And uh, by then, Harold had become a very um, respected person in the, because of the Olympia Band. You know, there was so many people wanted to get behind Harold and help him because he went through a lifetime before he had that band of helping people. He never asked you for anything. I mean, if you had to go to Montgomery, Alabama, and you were asking him, where's the best place to get a bus? Bus? I'll bring you there. You know, he just would do anything to help anybody, you know. And then, when he brought the Olympia Band to England for the first time, we, we had this party. On the, it was a very informal place. Well, we worked there for years. The Rolling Stones used to play intermissions to us there, so we were well known, you know. Anyways, um, so Harold came several times after that with the Olympia Band to England, you know, and he always took time out <coughs> to come visit with us. Mm -hmm and see his godson and all that, you know. And his family, um, they lived at 5000 Mexico Street. And it was, you always go out there. If you didn't go out there and visit them, his wife was named Rose. And Harold, he wanted so bad, he saved his money, he wanted to buy a Mustang. Lord knows what he wanted with that. But uh, anyway, once he got it, Man, he drives that damn thing all over town. He had a horn on it. But, uh, what does that horn say, Drew? Dixie? Da, 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 da. I mean, it was loud as, you know, you could hear it across the university. And he drives that damn thing around. He was so proud of that, you know. Well, what relation are you to Harold? My grandfather. Didn't that much out? Which was that. my daddy. I always called daddy. Yeah. I, Everybody around here would call him daddy. Well, when he brought me out here, he brought me out here many, many times. I don't know, 20 times probably. And he brought me out here and he said, I want you to introduce you to my family. And there was about 20 of them. And I've got a photograph, I'll show it to you in a little. The photograph, I don't even know who the devil they are in it. I know Rose, oh, yeah. and I know you, and I know Harold, and me, and Carol. That's the only one that I know. What was Harold, the name of Harold's parents? Mama, mm -hmm. you know your grandmother's name? What was the name? L.O.D. And what was your granddaddy's name? John, John. Asia. Well, where did Harold meet Rose? Here, New Orleans. They grew up together. They went to school together. Well, the school together. Then, uh, then she left and went on the road. Uh, the she was a dancer, made, uh, huh? Yeah, yes. they called that the carnival. They yeah. went with the carnival. And then he got married. Oh, he got married. And then after this, they, they got. Um, him and his first wife got divorced. Then my mother and him got married. Harold's first wife? Yeah. Now, who was Harold's first wife? She's dead now. I don't remember. Man. Eldred Alma. Harold, straight away, he was. He, he said, uh, what you, did what you come to New Orleans? What bring you to New Orleans me? And I said, uh, well, I'm interested in the jazz. And, uh, yeah, but he had such a such a career. I mean, you could go back and talk about your daddy, and you find his band with all these bands. Well, he had started like when he was thirteen years old, playing playing home, and uh, you know he was going to school. He used to jump out the window and go on out there to the places and play play band, play the band. You know. 
they were on there with his home. Mm -hmm. And he just grew up playing, playing the instrument like that. The big so, mom and for daddy was, I'm not saying this, but no, was when he had to go to England and be with you. That was <laughs> the biggest mom we couldn't stop hearing about that. Well, when he came to England, um, let me see, it was 65. And I thought maybe in New Orleans is his hometown. So I knew he wouldn't be nervous of anything. He'd go and talk to the President of the United States. Hey, how you doing? Well, you know, he wouldn't care. Yeah. But I thought when he came to England, maybe he'd be a little bashful. He was the same. Same thing. His mama was from France. She was a Frenchman. Yeah, he's a Frenchman. He was? How? No. Oh, how? How was mama. Oh, 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 okay. And uh, his daddy down here, he was a Creole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, this made him, made her kid. She was down here, he was born down here. Well, let me ask you this. Why did I kill? When Harold and Rose, I got a picture of them at the Gypsy Tea Room. Okay. Uh, they used to call it Little Gypsy, called it Little Gypsy. They used to serve the table. Yeah, yeah. Mother and them used to work there. And there would be gypsies. It was just a tea room, but there was the gypsies served the table. Daddy was playing music there. Mm -hmm. Then they had, uh, they, they worked at the Palace Theater. That was, uh, they used to have vaudevilles at that time. At the Palace, the Riss, and the Ace Theater, they had regular vaudeville shows, just like the shows come down here and be at the same group. They had that every week. They had it one or two nights a week at each theater. Well, daddy would play in the band. Mm -hmm. Mother would dance in the vaudeville. She was a, 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 a dancer, a hula hula dancer. My mama traveled just like my daddy traveled. Yeah, yeah. See, he had his band and travel, but she was in the vaudeville. They used to call them carnival shows and different things like that. Yeah. And they'll go from one place to the other, and they will entertain the people. Are you talking about your mother or your grandma? My mother. Rose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she yeah, would go yeah, from yeah. one place to the other, you know, entertain. Now, when did she stop? She stopped mm, years when she got maybe about five, seven years, when she started with the vaudevilles down here at the Palace Theater. They came in contact with each other like that. Now, this is another thing that Daddy did. And Daddy washed cars for 25 cents. Hmm. When he washed that car and get that 25 cents, he'll run home and bring that 25 cents home to my mother. Mother would give it to me to go around the corner, go get some red beans and some rice. And we used to ask for lime, but now ask for yarn. They'll give me an onion. We had our dinner. Then daddy would take and when um, President Roosevelt, he made jobs, w, uh, WPA, WPA. WPA job for the guys to come there and clean the gutters and pave the streets. Daddy worked for them. He was a farmer over them. He'll clean the gutters and things. Daddy would come home with his big boots full of mud. We'd get there, my sister and I get there and clean his boots all for the next day for him to go back to work again. So Daddy washed cars. He worked with WPA. And at nighttime, he went play music. He played with all kind of bands. I mean, he was. That's right. Up. He went play. He, wherever he could get a gig, they call them gigs. Yeah. Wherever he could get a gig, he went. He didn't want nobody to forgive him, and I told him, "I can anybody forget you." a dance at the place he worked. His name was Tom Stagg and he called and said, look, I've got this thing. They want a straight dance band. They don't know Dixieland. It's just 
So I told Harold, he said, damn, man, great. So I said, well, look, I said, I've got this friend of mine who plays tenor sax. So I said, if we just use the two saxophones and the rhythm section, he said, yeah, man, that'd be great. I said, can he play this guy? I said, yeah, he's very good. And we had uh, Harold on the alto, this guy Frank Brooker on the tenor, a uh, guy called Little Richard Simmons who played piano, John Coles played electric guitar, Terry Knight was our bass player in our Dixieland band, and me. And Harold loved that job. Oh man, he said he would have played there all night. He's still been playing it, you know what I mean? He loved it, because to see the people dancing. And he was playing waltzes, and, and luckily there's a recording of that, which we're hoping we'll use, because I own it, um, on the film. Well, we played things like uh, Hokey Pokey, Mexican Hat Dance, fascination, all just dance things and, uh, you know, I think that was the most enjoyable job that Harold played with us in time, from his point of view, the entire time he was there, you know. I mean, then he would have gone on playing, he'd have been there yet, you know what I mean? It just, he didn't want the job to end. And he said, can we play for another half hour? I mean, most uh, the musicians you work with on tours, they won't know when you're going to get off. <laughs> it was really a fabulous dance that we played. It was a shame it ever ended, but it was definitely Harold Toby. He said, it's the best record I ever made. Ever. And he made stacked of records, you know. In addition to what I was talking about with that record dance band material we made with Harold, a couple of interesting points here. Um, firstly, we had come from a brass band recording, Frank Booker and I and Harold, and we were zonked, but he didn't. He just went ahead, and the more the session went longer, the more he loved it. Um, he said he hadn't played a straight dance, uh, only in New Orleans, you know, in the whole tour that we did. So um, anyway, we got to, the, the people came up, they weren't jazz fans at all. One guy came up and said, can you play a gentleman, excuse me? And Harold said, what, what is that? So I said, well, it's just a, a dance, you know, and then you make a break and then they change partners, they get another woman. It goes on all through the dance. So he just turned to the rest of the band and said, Millenburg Joyce. <laughs> he entered into the spirit because uh, someone, uh, me actually, had to holler out to change partners, everybody, every time a break came. took the horn down from his lips and told us, change partners everybody, we change partners or something, you know. Yeah, he really enjoyed that. Godfather, and um, right since I was a little little kid, I remember distinctly. And every birthday until I was about eighteen or nineteen, when I came to live in New Orleans from London, um, Harold would send me uh, by the mail. He'd send me a, um, a packet of doubloons, 
Mardi Gras beads, Cracker Jack, a little <laughs> American oh. candy kind of thing. Yeah, popcorn. Popcorn, yeah, he'd send those things to me. Every single one, even when I was like sort of 14, 15, I was still getting boxes of Cracker Jack <laughs> from Harold, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, so on a human level, it seemed that everybody loved this guy, you know. Besides the fact he gave people work and things, it wasn't like that. They weren't mm -hmm. sucking up to him because, oh, you're employing me. It was different. He was a, just a fantastic guy. And as I say, I came to live through when I was, I think I was 18 or maybe 19, and um, spent a lot of time around him. Um, yeah, and then we started working with Harold, Marie Watanabe and myself. We started in a, in a, a trio. Mm -hmm. um, my father suggested to me, yeah, you would get Harold for a, for a band. And I was like, oh, well, he'd never do that. You know, he's Harold Dejan, he's not going to want to come and work in a trio. Sure enough, he did. He was really, really enthusiastic about it. Well, you were his godson. Yeah, but I don't think it was that. I think he, I think he just liked to work. He had um, incredible stamina. And then we formed this band with Harold, and he was so into it. And I said, well, we call it the Harold Dejan Trio, or unless you've got another name. He said, and he said, shit, yeah. Yeah, me and Martin in band. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not calling it a band with you in it. You're, the, you're Harold Dejan, you know, we call it. No, and he refused. He refused to say that. And he well, said, it must be my band. I guess mm -hmm. he was helping me, you know, in a way. Uh, and we stayed on Fritzl's on Bourbon Street. I think it's 733, maybe. 733 Bourbon. Okay. So for about four years, I worked with Harold every Friday and every Saturday night. And he was getting up in years by then. And mm -hmm. he'd, he'd invariably collect us in his car and we'd go drive all the way down. He'd drop us off. He wouldn't let us ride with him looking for a parking spot. He'd get the parking spot. And um, we'd go to work from 10.30, I think, till 2.30 in the morning. So it was a pretty late session. He had um, stamina. And it was Bourbon Street. And it was full of drunks. And, you know, um, if you've never worked on Bourbon Street, um, it's a hard um, job as a musician. You get people coming in, grabbing the drums, falling over on the stage, puking up. One night I'm oh, playing there with Harold and we, we saw a guy have a fight with a dog, which he thought was very funny. <laughs> this Alsatian dog wandered in off the streets and knocked someone's beer over and this, this guy said, yeah, go down, hit the dog. And the dog, instead of walking off, was, Argh! and they ended up wrestling around on the floor and we're playing and Harold, Harold's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he had a great sense of humour <laughs> and the last number of the night would always be a hot time in the old town tonight very fast mm -hmm. he'd knock it in on this and this is 2.30 in the morning or yeah. So. yeah yeah. and he'd be ba -da 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 -da. and you'd be like God, I'm <laughs> fall asleep he'd be going and if they wanted an encore he'd give them an encore one and that's it mm -hmm. all these college kids afterwards come on yeah more 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 He'd be packing his horn up, that was it. That was the professional side of it. As far as it was concerned, he was over. And he'd done an encore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, w I was um, very aware of, of who he was musically, Harold Dejan, because despite being my godfather, my mother had come to collect me from school in 72 or 73. She came to collect me from school and said, we got to take you to the dentist. And I was like, hmm. Took me out of school and the headmaster said, Okay, you can go to the dentist. She drove me to Staines, took me in the cinema, middle of the afternoon. And I'm still thinking, you know, I was a I don't know, seven or eight year old, whatever. I'm thinking, What's going on here? You know, this is good, I'm not in the dentist. Up on the screen comes James Bond movie Live and Let Die. Live and Let Die. And then the first couple of scenes, oh, wow, there's Harold. You know, he actually comes on in the movie scene. twice. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where, um, with Alvin Alcorn, and um, it's a famous scene, and that appears twice, pretty much the same scene. And then the umbrellas go up, and there's a funeral, Milton's there, Milton Batiste. The Olympia, <coughs> as far as I saw the Olympia, unlike my father who knew them earlier, I saw them from, from then onwards, kind of. And I was quite aware of the, the effect that, that James Bond movie had worldwide. They started touring all over the world, mm -hmm. um, largely because of being in the James Bond movie. That exposure in the movie. What better publicity could you get? You know? mm -hmm. And and the music was, 
was different from the older bands that I'd been listening to in my house on record, like the Young Tuxedo Band and these kind of things. I was aware that that music was different. It was more up to date. It was more, um, you know, in, in focus with modern times. I think subsequently I realised that was probably the influence of Milton Batiste, who was, you know, a, a very, I thought he was quite a charismatic figure. Mm -hmm. He also had more of an R&B background. Yes, he came from an R&B background. Mm -hmm. And he would play one-handed and you have a chunk of his head missing or whatever, God knows what had happened there. And, um, yeah, and they'd sing. Well, that wasn't really brass band tradition, was it? Mm -hmm. Singing in bands. And they'd have tambourines and things. Harold had introduced the white round tops, or black if you're on a funeral, to the hats. Mm -hmm. that um, previously the hats had been, I guess, octagonal or whatever, that's straight edges. But the round hats, of course, had come from way back, you know, in New Orleans tradition. And they'd gone for quite a long time, like the, the Eureka Band and Young Tuxedo, all these bands, you see them, they're invariably not in round tops. And Harold and Olympia started wearing these round ones, and they had, again, um, I think it was Harold that introduced the, the, the uh, colourless jackets, which was looking back to old times. Mm -hmm. And they were the first, and he had a leader. I mean, Harold was great to watch as well. He had a leader in on his, on his hat in gold. That's right. His mouthpiece to his saxophone was made out of some kind of red plastic, and I thought, that's weird. And you notice these things mm -hmm. as, a, as a youngster. Um, very visual, that band was, you know, I think. And they had a striking T-shirt, you know, Dejan's Olympia Brass Band. It was white with a steamboat on it and green and red writing. I remember that. Mm. He also had his phone number on his drum yeah. in the band. Yeah. Yeah, to so, uh, advertise. Good businessman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they took off, you know, big time around the world. They went to London. And there's stories there which are perhaps best not mentioned on camera, which <laughs> <laughs> things that they get up to in London. I will say that, that I know that they were a very wild living band. Not Harold because I know from a couple of members when all these crazy things went on, more like a rock band had been on the road, that they said they wouldn't do it in front of Harold. Um, really? Yeah. How many members did they have at that point? I don't know. That was another thing. It was by that period, my father's dealt with the earlier period on, mm -hmm. on this uh, film, but by that period, it was a floating thing. Sometimes they'd be eight, sometimes they'd be six, sometimes whatever. And people would, on tours, There'd be a certain lineup. You catch them a month down the road, it might be a different lineup. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can, at the end of this film, I guess we'll verify the members and the names and things. But it was kind of a floating, it was a very loose thing. And I got the impression that that all came from Milton. I don't think that came from Harold. As manager. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was manager, and he was more than manager because he was also influencing things in a big way. And this is my personal subjective take on it, is that. Harold maybe couldn't be bothered, didn't want to, whatever, but I think the power there went like that in some respects. I think Milton started making decisions and um, mm -hmm. the direction. So he became a musical director of I think so, too. yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just the impression, that's the impression I get. I will tell one funny story that I think is funny, okay. and Milton's relatives might not appreciate it, but... <laughs> Harold was going down to City Hall for some ceremony to be honoured you know, somewhere or other. And Harold, he said, yeah, I'm going to be down there, they give me a certificate, a medal or something, um, as the Olympia band leader. Uh, he said, there'd be a lot of dignitaries there and, you know, the local government or whatever. I said, oh, I said, so you and Milton? Shit no, Milton ain't no dignitary. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Who knows what they're... Um, relationship was like. But I, know, I do know that they, they got involved with a kind of a wild, wild living style in Europe. You know, there'd be, um, some of them were involved with prostitutes, they'd see, and they were heavy drinkers, and maybe more, more than drinkers, whatever that, you read into that what you will. But that was behind Harold's back. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that from two different members. Uh, Boogie was a snare drummer, and um, and Wendell Eugene went on a tour with them, and he said he didn't want to ever go on a tour with them again. 
as I say, it got more like a rock band. I mean, they, they were touring on the strength of the James they, Bond film. They were living the life. They were kind of rock stars. Yeah. They were having fun. Didn't they play for Queen Elizabeth? I presume so. I, I'm not up on it exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a picture of them, some with Princess Margaret, so I, yeah, so they would have played for Queen Elizabeth. That was a big thing, you know, and mm -hmm. kept it going for years and years. When I played with Harold, as I mentioned earlier, that was subsequent to all that, mm -hmm. obviously, time-wise. And by that time, he, he was playing the Preservation Hall on Sundays. So he's working with me on Friday and Saturday till 2.30 in the morning. Preservation Hall at that time finished at 12.30 at night. So he was, you know, still working right Three up. Three nights a week, yeah. Hard working guy, right to the end. Mm -hmm. The other thing I remember as an example of his generosity was he brought round, again, the Dixie horn sounded. I, I opened the shutters in my house. He's out there in his car. Emil, come and help me, I ain't going to lift this myself. I went out there and he had a, a Fender Rhodes, which is a huge electric keyboard, mm -hmm. very heavy, it has weighted keys um, in the back of his, in his car, which at the time was a Cadillac. And uh, he bought it for Marie. And he said, here, we never want any money, he said, take this. And he gave her this instrument. That's nice. Which was, you know, an example of his generosity. Mm -hmm. And that had extended, I'd seen that all my life, from childhood onwards, you know, he'd come over to England, my father would bring him over and he'd do a tour. Mm -hmm. And he'd take us on his afternoon off, when most people would be sleeping or whatever, he'd take us to a toy shop and buy us toys and, what, you know, all that kind of thing. He was very, very generous like that, you know, I can't stress that enough. And when we used to ride around in his car with him, you'd go through um, the, the Treme or somewhere like that, a neighbourhood, um, predominantly black neighbourhood, at that time, at least, <laughs> times right. are changing, and everybody would know him. They nicknamed him Duke. In my pronunciation, say Duke, but Duke, as Americans say, hey Duke, hey, 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 and they'd all be screaming and shouting, and he'd be like, all right, boys, all right, calm, you know, like calm them down. And as, as I said, it was like the Beatles or the Pope or someone was passing <laughs> through. Everybody, people come out of the houses to wave to him. That's great. He was yeah, loved yeah. In, in his community. And, you know, and respected. Um, a, a lot of times in this in these communities you'll see so-and-so who's a musician or whatever and they're associated with good timing and drinking and falling in the gutter and yeah, 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 he, he was he was more dignified than that. Mm -hmm. You know, people would, act, people would treat him in a dignified way. We recorded with him at 3621 Burgundy, my father's house. Um, on the Eagle Brass Band session, and that was quite that was very moving because on the dirges he took really complete control of the of the, the band or at mm -hmm. least the horn section, which includes the trumpets and I mean all the horns. We kept recording this thing. We did it about maybe three times. I forget the the piece, whichever it was. It was slow funeral dirge, and in the end he put his horn down. No, I'm telling you, you know, he did never feel he was angry, but he was very assertive, mm -hmm. and he. And he, he was directing the, what he called the swells. You know, bring the music up, get the emotion out of it. And he absolutely was knew exactly what he wanted mm -hmm. in the, the emotive side of it. Yeah. And yeah. if it wasn't there, he, he made us do it again and again. You know, and we did that quite often, which is rare in jazz recordings because jazz is in the moment. It's not like written, largely. But he wanted to do it till it was just right. And you know, that was impressive. And interesting, and I learned quite a lot out of out of him doing that. Mm -hmm. 